Welcome to the Good Christophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. For our talk this week, we're listening to an exhortation that was given by Brother David Frazier back in 2017 at the Pinewood Ecclesia in South Africa. Uh, The title of Brother David's exhortation is My Rock and My Salvation, and he is taking a look at the story of David specifically and two of the Psalms of David that cover the period in David's life when he was feeling at his lowest point at the time when Absalom was leading the rebellion against him. And Brother David in his exhortation is just looking at the concept of who is our rock and how we can take examples from those Psalms from David and David's lowest point. Uh, And he makes examples of a couple other characters in scriptures as well, but just something that where when we're feeling really beaten down, depressed, or or struggling, something that we can pull on. And uh, I found this exhortation to be a really uplifting one, just a really, one of those kind of really solid, almost like meat and potatoes style exhortations that's just really uplifting, really encouraging, kind of gets you in a a, a real good frame of mind, um, especially if you're feeling feeling a little, a little discouraged or you're having a, a rough day. Um, this is one that just kind of reminds you of what uh, tremendous hope that we have in our God and thanks to the sacrifice of his son. Uh, So this was just an exhortation that I thought was a really great one to share. Um, Really enjoyed listening to it. Brother David has been on for a couple of other talks, and he's a very enjoyable brother to to listen to speak. Looking forward to sharing this one to you. Uh, As always, please feel free to continue to sending in recommendations or suggestions, um, either of speakers or classes or exhortations. Um, We had somebody who gave us one right after the exhortation for their ecclesia was done and as soon as it was uploaded sent us the link so that's always really exciting to uh, to have one that was so exciting they wanted to jump on it as soon as they got it uh, so if you have those send them our way we appreciate them as always and uh, hope that everyone is staying safe and you're continuing to find uh, upliftment and encouragement from these talks um, we we thank you for all the uh, encouragement that we've gotten from people who are writing in telling us how much that they appreciate these classes and we're glad that people are continuing to find them useful even as we get into the 110th episode which still boggles my brain every time i I look at the number when we're setting up new episodes every week so uh, as always thank you very much for listening and god bless and with that we will turn it over to brother david frazier for his exhortation my rock and my salvation my dear brethren and sisters Part of being human is that we all experience difficulties, and some of these difficulties we know are self-inflicted. They're due to the lives that we live or the circumstances that we're in. And then, of course, some of those are due to external circumstances, things caused by people and circumstances around us. And built into each and every one of us are a number of coping mechanisms. They are very much animal coping mechanisms, And these include things like denial or regression to childish behavior or anger or dissociation or distraction. There's a range of coping mechanisms that human beings engage in. But there are other circumstances which cause a completely different reaction in our lives and evoke a completely different response. And what I'm going to refer to is those circumstances and times in your life when you've reached a point when you just want to run away from it all. And I think at different times in our lives, all of us have just wanted to get away from the problems that we face. And if you, like me, have gone through those times, you're not alone in Scripture. We know in 1 Kings 19 that Elijah went for his life. He ran into the cleft of the rock in Horeb and pleaded to God for his own life to be extinguished and for the life of his people to be extinguished. We know that Jeremiah himself 
yearned for a small place in the country, a lodging place of wayfaring men, away from all of those treacherous countrymen who hated him, who hated his message of redemption, who couldn't tolerate the very sight of Jeremiah, even away from his family and neighbors and friends, not one of whom he could trust. That's Jeremiah 9. Some have fled into ships to try and get away from their problems, and others have fled into the wilderness. Jonah, whose name means a dove, rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He just wanted to get away. He went to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah wanted to run away. And of course, when eventually he preached to the city of Nineveh, and the city of Nineveh listened and repented, it displeased Jonah, so he was exceedingly angry, as Scripture says in Jonah 4. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, just like Elijah had said, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And of course, Elijah went and sat under a juniper tree. Jonah went and sat under this booth, and a gird covered him. Both of them sat, waiting for their lives to end. But what I'd like to consider today, brethren and sisters, is how to deal with these things through a very special man. And that very special man is King David. If you would like to open your Bibles to the first reference we're going to look at, it's Psalm 55. Now, Psalms 54 and 55 belong to a pair of Psalms that express David's incredibly troubled feelings at a time of inordinate distress a time when close betrayal was at hand. David had his own Judas, and that was none other than Ahithophel, whose name means the brother of folly, the one who he used to trust but was now a brother of folly. This was his erstwhile counselor, his confidant, but now was now the right-hand man of Absalom, David's son. And the psalm that we're going to consider, 55, belongs to the latter part of those four years during which the rebellion of Absalom was coming to a head. It was a time in which those who were supporting Absalom were so confident of their cause that they didn't need to hide it any longer. They could actually publicly express their distaste for David. So David's words ring out in verse 4 of Psalm 55. My heart is sore pained within me. The Hebrew says, my heart is pounding in my chest and the terrors of death have fallen upon me fearfulness and trembling have come upon me and horror hath overwhelmed me and maybe in some way shape or form you and I could feel those feelings in some days and David then says those famous words and I said oh and you can hear the sigh oh that I had the wings Uh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness. Think on these things. And in verse 17, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. The Hebrew word for cry aloud is the moaning of a dove, and he shall hear my voice. So you see, during the time when David was a shepherd out in the hills of Judea, he had watched those little rock pigeons, the rock doves, as they had circled and circled into the high craggy rocks and made their nests up there in the high and lofty places to escape the wind and the weather and the predators. And we read about these in Psalms, in chapter 2 at verse 14, and in Jeremiah And it's no mistake then that the apparent title of the Psalms is, the apparent title appears 
at the top of Psalm 56. And that title at the top of Psalm 56 is actually the subtitle of Psalm 55. And the subtitle is, To the Chief Musician Upon Jonath Elam Rechakim, which simply means the dove, to the dove of the distant terebinths. So there is the dove. David was feeling that he wanted to be like a little rock pigeon and just escape from all his troubles and get away. And what about the distant terebinths? Well, the terebinths terebinths trees are a member of the pistachio family and they typically grow in solitude. They don't grow in groves. They grow in solitude in the desert places. And David could imagine himself just flying away like a dove to a distant tree in the wilderness. And all of those things are contained in those words. The wilderness is the far-off place in verse 7. He is the dove in verse 6. And he is crying aloud to his God in verse 17. So here's the king of Israel, King David, who is a man after God's own heart, absolutely trembling with distress, his heart pounding in his chest, mourning like a dove to his God, wishing that he had the wings of a dove to bear him away into the wilderness. But there's something incredibly different in the way that David behaves. And we see a suggestion of this in verse 22. Look at verse 22 of Psalm 55. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. That's a level of stability that David said was available for the righteous. So then, brothers and sisters, what is different in the way that David handled his troubles? If the natural instinct is to run away from it all and just to get out and get away, David was very different. David wanted to run away from his troubles, yes, but his desire was to fly into the protection of Yahweh. So here was a dove who wanted to get away but not just to vanish, he wanted to fly into the protection of Yahweh. How do we know that? Well, we know it by looking at other Psalms of David. And you don't need to turn them up. In Psalm 11, verse 1, David says, In Yahweh put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? And that's a rhetorical question. David said, I'm trusting in my God. How do you say to my soul, just flee away like a bird? The only way I can flee is to flee into the God of my trust. Or Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, where David says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. So he's looking for his salvation. He's looking at those high and great craggy rocks, the stability which never changes. And then he asks the question, from whence cometh my help? From those hills, my help cometh from the Lord. He was absolutely plain as to where the source of his help was going to be. Or Psalm 32 verse 7, he says, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. And this was God. God was the one to whom David could run into for his protection not just running away from trouble. So he says in verse 1 of Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. So when David was trembling with distress like this, brethren and sisters, what was it about Yahweh that gave David the comfort that really worked for him? But you and I know that when we're really distressed, There's almost nothing that can give us comfort. But you see, when David was so weak like that, God was very strong. But the question was whether that strength and that solidity of God's was going to be David was dependent on whether David wanted to flee from trouble or whether he was going to make the decision to flee into the protection of Yahweh. Have a look at Psalm 18, if you wouldn't mind, the first three verses. 
Psalm 18, verses 1 to 3. So David says in Psalm 18, verse 1, I will love thee, O Yahweh, my strength. You see, the strength of David was not in his own arm. It's not in man that walketh to direct his ways. And then he specifically says, Yahweh is my rock. The Hebrew word sur. Yahweh is my rock. It's not my own confidence or just escaping trouble that's going to save me. It's because I am in my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. He uses the next word, my ale, my power, to describe his God. My strength, which is another word for rock, called sila, in whom I trust, my buckler or shield, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Look at the collection of beautiful attributes that are God's. And that can be David's. If David does one thing. And that's verse 3. I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The so is the pivotal word there. If David's going to be saved from those who have something against him. It's because he is putting his trust only in his God. And it's a beautiful imagery. If you just imagine in your mind, David looking out across a plain to this ragged, craggy rock at the end of the plain. And you imagine the soaring heights of that rock, unscalable by any foes. It's permanent, despite the weather, despite all changes. And David looks at that great craggy orifice, at the top and sees a place of abode, a place, place of quiet, and he longs to be there, a place of defense, a place of solidity, a place where things don't change. And then David pens these wonderful two psalms that we read as our opening reading. If you wouldn't mind coming with me to Psalm 61 and 62. And this wonderful pair of psalms, like Psalm 55 we considered, also belongs to the time when Absalom was building up his treacherous betrayal. And in these psalms is expressed the sad anxiety of a king who was dejected. He had tried the best for his people and for his God. He was now unloved by his own people. He was being pushed into exile by the ones that he had fought and spilled blood for. And there was also the terrible sorrow and frustration of this bereaved father who watched his own dear son Absalom desert both him and the truth and walk in the wilderness. That's what David had to watch and his heart was overburdened with pain. So Psalm 61 verse 1. Hear my vehement cry, says the Hebrew. This was not just an appeal. This was a heart-wrenching appeal. Hear my vehement cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in the tab thy tabernacle forever. I will trust or make my refuge in the covert of thy wings. Selah. So the, day, the distress that David was experiencing here, brothers and sisters, was not that type of distress that could simply be borne by the fortitude of faith. Just simply toughing your way through a problem. Or just saying, don't worry, it will be all right. No, David says, as it says in verse 2, he was completely overwhelmed. He was in over his head in trouble. This was not something light. And his plea to his God is to lead him. He is desperate for God to do the leading. And in doing that, David is showing that he's prepared to give complete submission to his God. And complete dependence. And that's the preparation of our hearts, my dear brethren and sisters, to serve our Lord. Submission. 
and dependence. And you know, when you're in that type of position, you realize that no flesh can save you in any case. Not your own, not your brethren and sisters, not anybody else's. It is only God. And it was to this great rock that David appeals. When everything else underneath his feet was shaking, he appeals to the solidity, the calm, serenity, and salvation of God. And as the Revised Version says, he says, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. The Revised Version says, lead me to a rock that is too high for me. This was the place of safety that David would look at, look at that and wish he had the wings of the dove that he could ascend it because it was unscalable by human power. He needs to be in that craggy rock of salvation, that tower, that place of permanence and solidity. But he can't get there. This is a rock that is too high for me. And in that, David's next path of preparation is ready. He realizes without divine assistance, he will never have that peace. Isn't that wonderful? David wanted to get to that rock, but there was nothing he could do to scale it. He realized he needed divine assistance to be there. But David didn't view it as an obstacle because he knew that he could run into the name of Yahweh and it would be his providential care. As David's wise son Solomon said in Proverbs 18 verse 10, the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous righteous runneth into it and is safe. With all that the name of Yahweh entails, the promise of eternity, the promise of salvation, the promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. And the righteous can run into that promise and be protected. And David was at pains then to show that only in Yahweh was his deliverance. There was no other man who could save. Who else could take David up that craggy rock to the place of his redemption? And God would never leave or forsake those who put that trust in him. And that leads us to the next psalm. And David uses a very rare Hebrew phrase, six times in the psalm, in fact, to certify that it is only God who is our rock and our salvation. The other psalm that he penned, which uses the similar phrase, is Psalm 39. And you see the first four uses of this phrase in Psalm 62 with the words, opening word, truly. And in verse 2, it's the word only, verse 5 only, verse 6 only. David understood that it was only in the certification of God's strength that there was any hope for mankind. Only my soul can wait upon God. In other words, God was the only source of anchor for David's soul. And that word soul waiting means to be silent in the Hebrew. He actually had to take peace and solace in his God because he had now run into him. For from him cometh my salvation. Verse 2. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. Who else is going to save but Yahweh? He is my defense. And he says, I shall not be greatly moved. And then verse 5. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. You see, by trusting in Yahweh as his rock, David was now able, like that little dove that took its path into the craggy rocks, to be able to weather the storms of opposition that came upon him. Did you notice the subtle change, and it's borne out in the Hebrew, by the way, between verse 2 and verse 6? He starts off not being greatly moved, 
And then finally, once his trust is perfected, verse 6, I shall not be moved. He is now settled and at peace in God. So the wonderful thing then, brothers and sisters, is that this permanence and the solidity of God becomes the permanence and confidence and stability of David too. Yes, he was temporarily shaken by trials, but he was not destroyed by them. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed, said the Apostle Paul. So David then ends that beautiful section of the psalm with consolation, which is, as you see at the end of verse 8, not just for him. It's a consolation for us. Yahweh's not just a refuge for David, it's for many people. Because you see, David went through all of these things as examples for our learning. And what are the two things that David said we have to do? So when we fly into this rock of Yahweh, what does verse 8 say we must do? Trust in Yahweh at all times. Only in God and always. And the second thing, pour out your heart to him in prayer and cease not. That's the message that David gives to us. That's what it means to flee into the rock. That is Yahweh. Trust in Yahweh at all times and pour out your heart to him in prayer. And he compares this trust in Yahweh with the vanity of verses 9 and 10 of people, the ordinary people who are just like a whisper, like a smoke. The great people of this world, as the Hebrew says, are just a sham. When you put them in a balance, they just light in the air and they fluff away. Or he says, uncertain riches that people trust in that just vanish into the, the, the dusts of time against those we have. The solidity of the rock, which is Yahweh. He never changes. And that's our confidence. So these beautiful attributes then of Yahweh are the things in which we will place our trust, brethren and sisters. As the rock, he is unchanging Despite the flux and the change of our lives, our rock is strong even when we are weak. Our rock is permanent when we feel so frail. Our rock offers us impregnable protection when people or troubles threaten to overwhelm us. Our rock is stable when we feel our feet slipping. Our rock is a shelter when the weather of life beats upon us. Our rock is immovable in a world when everything seems to be crumbling. Our rock is high and lofty. He is elevated but achievable by grace. Our rock is a rock of salvation when there's no one else to save. And this is what's been presented to you and me, dear brethren and sisters, in the words that we've read today. So in conclusion, we would want to just consider the Lord Jesus Christ Because we know that the uncertainties and the weaknesses that David felt were in many ways messianic. Most of those psalms that David wrote actually had a primary application to himself and a secondary application to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we felt these things acutely, brethren and sisters, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ has felt them many, many times more. Just read Psalm 22 in your own time if you don't think that to be the case. Hebrews 4 verse 15 in the Jewish Bible says, We do not have a high priest unable to empathize with our weakness, since in every aspect he was tempted just as we are, the only difference being that he did not sin. So despite every single trouble, every opposition ranged against him, every distress in his life when he felt the waters were going over his head, He put those two key principles into practice. He trusted in Yahweh at all times, and he poured out his heart to Yahweh in prayer. Open your Bibles with me at Psalm 40, please, just for one or two verses there. But Psalm 40 is one of those beautiful messianic uh, psalms which 
puts these principles into perspective in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can imagine the Lord Jesus Christ saying these things. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. You see, that's the first part of it. He put his trust in Yahweh at all times. And the second part, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He had poured out his heart in prayer to his father. And what was the result of this? He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. You see, he was feeling unstable, like we often do. But God set his feet upon a rock and established permanently his goings. Will Christ not do the same for us? Of course he will, because the psalm continues to say, he hath put a new song in my mouth. Not a song of mourning like a dove, but the song of salvation. Even praise to our God. Many shall see it. This is us today. And fear and shall trust in the Lord. As a result of what we've heard, what we've seen David go through and the Son of God go through, we see, we fear, and we, like them, will trust. So as a result of all of that wonderful trust, brethren and sisters, David become, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the one who was prophesied of in Isaiah 32. And you don't need to turn it up, because in Isaiah 32 it simply says, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as an hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And that's prophecy, brethren and sisters, is a prophecy of Christ. Here was the man, weak, ish, Edom, of the flesh, who became the rock. Here was the one who became the hiding place, the man who became a hiding place from the wind, from the tempest of waters in the wilderness and a shadowing rock in a weary land. Christ is now our rock and our salvation. And this brings us to the last reference that we'll look at is in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 4 to 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, at verse 4, we know that, as Paul says, the Jews who were following in the wilderness all drank of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. He was in the spirit in all of history, pointing to the time when he would be the real redeemer of Israel. And verse 11, Now all of these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We are sitting at the end of this age. This world is spiraling out of control. And for our admonition, these things were written. These things were written as examples to encourage us. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. But what was Paul alluding to? Look at verse 13. There's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted to suffer trouble above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. See, Paul understood that you would run into the rock, the citadel, the high tower of God, and in so doing would be able to bear it. So how do we escape? We run into our rock. We trust only in the Lord at all times. And we pour out our hearts to him in prayer. And we shall be established upon our rock. And as we look to our rock now, we partake of the same spiritual drink and eat of the same spiritual meat. And we are thankful for our rock. 
the man who is the covert from the storm, our rock in a weary land. Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash GCT. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.